on this video. Welcome everybody to our webinar today. My name is Megan Jackson and today I will be talking about some alternative strategies to punishments and rewards. So let's get going. Here we are. And sorry, just a second. Wanted to make sure that I have myself. Can everybody see? I don't know if you can see me. <laughs> I'm sorry, new to this. I'm fiddling with the controls here as I'm going. So, okay, hopefully you can see my face in this. I'm not sure what I'm seeing, but I'm working on it. So here we are. I'll just keep going. So we're gonna talk about some positive discipline techniques that work. So let's start off with, Okay, I'm new to this. Forgive me, I'm going to stop the screen share for one second. And I'm trying to figure out the PowerPoint part of this. Okay. There we go, we've got it. So, sorry about the delay, everybody. Just working out the technology kinks. So today I wanna make sure I tell you who I am, talk a little bit about what is positive discipline, as well as some specific strategies so that you can have an actual practical takeaway from your time with me here and connect with you a little more afterwards and let you know a bit more about some programs that I have. So my name is Megan Jackson. I am a homeschooling and parenting coach and founder of Joyful Mud Puddles. I work with families to help guide them from feeling overwhelmed to confidence and peace. I've been doing this for a number of years. What brought me to becoming a parenting coach was my own personal story of transformation. I am a working a homeschooling mom. So I have two companies that I run. One that my husband is an electrician and I manage all the office work for that. I'm also a parenting coach. I have three active young boys who are, have always been homeschooled with me. So I know what it's like to be busy, to be trying to manage everything and juggling a lot of different tasks. What happened to us was that I was doing too much and I own that and recognize it now, but I was trying to do it all. And in the middle of that, I went through a second miscarriage. Our company was going through some financial difficulties and my whole world was just crashing in on me. People were beginning to notice. My neighbors, my family, they were constantly coming up to us and telling us that we needed to get some help. And when other people see that you're having a problem, you just can't hide that anymore. That's not something you can let go or sneak in. And I decided I needed to go and reach out and get some help. So I looked into some different parenting coaches and worked with several over uh, the course of a year or so. The change in me has been, like I'm not the same person I was. And my friends have noticed, everyone's noticing how happier I am how much more peace our family has as well. I, when something like that happens in your life, you just can't hide it at all. It's not something you can keep to yourself. I wanted to make sure that other people were able to have that experience and have that support as well. So that's when I began looking into becoming a parenting coach and I'm so excited to be able to share that with others. So let's talk a bit about what is discipline. Discipline really comes from a Latin fancy word that means instruction and training. Discipline is also comes, disciple also comes from the root word 
meaning student. Unfortunately, the modern definition, according to Oxford Dictionary, has discipline as meaning the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior using punishment to correct disobedience. And that's what most people think of when they think of discipline. They think of, um, they think of punishment, they think of rewards, and it's really unfortunate, actually, because that's not what the original intent of the word was meant for. So with the original intent in mind, let's move forward and talk more about how we can include some positive discipline in our lives. Because for some reason, we got the crazy idea that to get children to do better, first we have to make them feel worse. And I don't see how that connects in their world or in ours. And that quote is from Jane Nelson, who wrote Positive Discipline. So if we're talking about the five criteria for positive discipline, I'm not sure why my screen, if you're watching the replay, why it keeps showing more or less people. So uh, forgive that little blip there. There we go. The five criteria for positive discipline is that it helps children feel a sense of connection. That means that children have a deep longing for belong a, a deep longing for belonging and significance. We want to make sure that whatever we're choosing to do is mutually respectful and encouraging. You can be kind and firm at the same time. We have to make sure that it's effective in the long run. Consider what the child is thinking, feeling, and learning, and deciding about himself and his world and what to do in the future in order to survive and thrive. Anything you do, if it doesn't have long-term, if you aren't thinking long-term, then you're just gonna have to redo that behavior again in the long run. We want to make sure that we're teaching important social and life skills, respect, concern for others, problem solving and cooperation, as well as the skills to contribute to home, school, and the larger community. We also want to make sure that we invite children to discover how capable they really are. Encourages, this encourages the constructive use of power and autonomy. We don't want to get into power struggles with our children. That again was by Jane Nelson from Positive Discipline. What other names can we use? So, so if you don't love the word or the term discipline, you can also use gentle parenting, peaceful parenting, respectful parenting, attachment parenting, or mindful parenting. All of these focus on building a deep relationship of mutual respect, teaching how, the hows and whys of what we're doing, as well as focusing on solutions. And I, I prefer using gentle parenting. That just comes up a lot more in the world that I work in. Now let's get into some specific parenting strategies. Oh, I'm going to add some more people here that are joining us. Sorry about that. And I'll pop the chat back up. There we go. Okay, so let's get into some positive strategies that we can use and make sure that everyone has some actual takeaways. Parenting communication tools that, oh, that should be a C, that can be used to gain cooperation, understanding, and better connection with your children. Because ultimately the goal is that we wanna connect with our children. We don't wanna get into these power struggles. We don't want to have to, keep punishing them. 
that's a lot more work on us to be honest you have to, if you implement rules and regulations that's all on the parents that has to be able to keep track of what punishments they are when they're doing them what's going on let's like make our lives easy in the process so the first strategy i want to introduce is called breaking the code and I think somebody, if you're a participant and you're not muted, you could mute yourself because that would be helpful. Otherwise, I can go in and mute just to your doors closing in the background. So breaking the code, children often have an underlying reason behind their behavior. So we need to be a detective and look for the needs behind their feelings and actions. My first go-to's is to see, could they be hungry or tired? I get some very hangry children in my house. If you have to think about all of a sudden, halfway through the day, you're wondering, why on earth is my toddler having such a hard time today? And then you remember that they were up in the night or up really early, or someone was sick the day before, and you, a light bulb goes on, and you're like, oh, that's why. That's why I'm having such a hard day. So the first key would be, looking at are they hungry are they tired are they overheating are they overwhelmed what could be going on there's also four other main challenges that we often see with children and i was talking to that when one of my parenting groups the other day so if you find that your child is wanting some undue attention they keep um they keep interrupting, they're keeping you busy, they're wanting to get special attention. What that really means is that they want you to notice them and involve them usefully. So we're gonna talk about some other ideas you can do specifically for that. If they're looking to be more bossy, misguided power, they want to be in control. Try what they're asking for really is to let them help and to give them more choices. Maybe they're feeling like they're being too controlled and they want to take more control over their, their lives. If you find your child is seeking revenge or wanting to get even, that happens a lot with siblings, so keep that one in mind. Then you're going to want to think that what they're really saying is they're hurting. Validate my feelings. And often you could do that, or if you're working through a struggle with a sibling, once their feelings have been validated, it might not totally solve the problem, but it definitely eases up on a lot. Another one that comes up often is assumed inadequacy. You'll notice that they want to give up or be left alone. That one's a little trickier sometimes. We do have a lot of perfectionist children or children that just they've been trying so hard and they want to give up, try giving them small little steps. Instead of saying, oh, you're capable, I know you can do this. Sometimes the task is just too overwhelming for them and they need a little bit of help and guidance. The next strategy that I want to introduce is called asking for help. If you notice that a lot of the strategies above that we just talked about really have something to do with the children wanting to contribute or help. It's more effective to allow a child to experience being needed and useful rather than just telling them that they're, they're capable. So some suggestions is to ask for opportunities for help. Um, hey, I'm working on dinner. Can you come help me with this? Sometimes they might think that you're tricking them into doing chores, so you'll have to work on the wording carefully there. But my older son loves to do all the yard work. And when we ask him to drive the lawn tractor or chop wood or be in charge of something, that's also really good for the child who seems like they're being bossy. Give them a special task. They could be the toy monitor to make sure that everything gets put away properly. Or they could be in charge of making sure that the sand stays in the sandbox without being too pushy, in, of course. Be sure your children how much know how much you love and appreciate their help. Don't take them for granted. The more often you thank them genuinely without being too cheesy, the more often that they'll be willing to help again in the future. Be sure that your motivation is also in the right place when you're out, oh, sorry, when you're asking curiosity questions. So instead of 
coming to a child and saying, what just happened here? Or why did you do this? Because I know that that comes up often. Asking questions instead helps them to relax and to feel like they're not going to be um, in trouble right away. Especially if your child or teen has gone and done something, um, you catch them on like a website they shouldn't have or you're, they're, they're skipping school or whatever it is, instead of coming in on the attack, come in with a, an open curiosity to find out why. Uh, children can sense if you're trying to trick them. And don't ask questions that you're really wanting a specific answer for. So ask genuinely and from the heart. So you can ask what happened, why did you think that that happened, how can we solve this? Gets them to open up more and then you see their side of the story and they're more willing to share when they realize that you're wanting to know more about what actually happened. Again, if you have any questions as we're going along, you can put them in the chat section or save them from the end as well. Going along with uh, curiosity questions, this one is another asking but not telling. Have you ever noticed that we're always telling children what to do? We're directing them, we're guiding them, we're giving them a blow by blow of the day, even if we're trying to help them to be curious. Um, this goes along well with the fact that all the children are home from school now. And I know a lot of parents really want their kids to be engaged and, and interested and curious, but we have to be careful that we're not telling all the time. We're asking questions. Um, it invites the child to think and choose for themselves. But you have to be really careful. This one, um, Kim John Payne from Simplicity Parenting has a great analogy about this one. That if you ask a child, okay, shall we go get in the car now? Shall we put on your shoes? Would you like to have your dinner now? You are technically asking questions, but you're wanting them to agree. You're not giving them a chance to, um, you're giving them the chance to say no, to be honest. So uh, you don't want that. You want open questions, such as, what do you need to do in order to get ready for school? This stops a lot of the nagging. Get ready for school. Bus is coming. Gotta get ready. Put it on them. Let's brainstorm. Uh, the milk spilled. Okay, what do we do about that? So the, it, it lightens the mood. It encourages um, the question. I see we have a question here. It says, do you have any mantras or phrases that parents can say to themselves to break the hidden agenda question? That's a great one. Thank you for that question, Heather. Um, so if we go back a few, well, I'll just answer it now. Um, I'm trying to always remind myself that the child is having a problem. They aren't the problem. Focusing, another mantra I have is connection over correction. We want to connect with our kids first before trying to correct them. A simple one would be choose love. If you're coming at this with love, what are you going to do? Instead of nagging and arguing and yelling, we want to work on noticing that they're just a child. And if you are looking for specific mantras, I've got a special um, cheat sheet for you that I'll tell you more about at the end. So I'll try to remember that. So when we're asking and not telling, we're getting the kids involved more. Children, when they take more ownership of the problem and the solution, they're more willing to work with you. This one is a great one. Um, I was just chatting with somebody on Facebook today about their kids cleaning up toys. And they're always dumping the toys on the ground. It's always a mess. The mom's trying to pick it up. She was thinking of implementing some kind of, like the kids are gonna have to pay her because she's having to do more work. Again, that's putting more on the parent. You have to remember that they didn't clean up. You have to remember to pay them or not, or that get the money from them if they're not doing their chores. Ask them, get them involved. Ask them, hey, I've noticed that we have got a problem here. What can we do about this? This next one, do, don't versus don't, it's this, uh, especially great for younger children. If you can start this one early on, that would be really handy because then 
it just, you get, they get used to that positive language. So tell them what they can do versus what they can't do. And then what happens is your children remember the last few words of what you said. So if you're saying don't kick, they only heard you say kick. So they're gonna keep kicking. But if we're saying um, walk please, they're hearing walking. If we're saying, um, this, this gives them choice as well. It helps them to think of that I have an alternate solution. So if you don't want them to throw a ball in the house, you can say, hey, looks like you wanna throw a ball. Let's do that outside. Or switch it up and say, there's a softer ball you can throw in the house. They'll, they'll be surprised. What, I, I actually can do something? Children get so used to being told what they can't do when they hear no all the time. Think of how you can say yes, but in a way that you, you feel comfortable and it lets them know what they can do in the house or around. This one I've talked a lot about, we're gonna focus on solutions. So instead of focusing on blame, focus on solutions. Children know when they've already done something wrong. They, they know they weren't supposed to hit. They know they weren't supposed to color on the couch. They know they weren't supposed to blow up. So blaming them just makes them feel worse about themselves. It makes them wonder if you actually unconditionally love them. Family meetings are a great way to model this uh, important life skills. Regular meetings, let your children know that their issues are important and will be addressed regularly. This is another wonderful one for teachers too in the classroom. So if you are a teacher, that would be a fantastic one to regularly schedule those. But you can use this strategy anytime. Identify what the problem is. Hey guys, I've noticed that um, that the house is just really getting messy now that we're home a lot more. Can you help me think of some solutions that we can do to, to fix that? And, and if you need to explain why it's important to you, then that's fine too, so that they realize, hey, maybe this is a problem for the whole family. Then brainstorm as many possible solutions as you can. You'd be amazed at what your children come up with. Pick one that works, try it for a few days, and then reevaluate if it doesn't work. That's real life. That's what we do as adults. Why not start teaching that to your children right away when they're younger so that they can get used to doing that? And there's nothing wrong if a solution isn't working. That's fantastic. You can come and say, hey, remember we tried this solution? I don't think that that's working. Do you? What do you guys think about that? Let's try again. And then just pick a new one. Okay, this one is one of my favorites because <laughs> I've got three active, funny, hilarious boys in my life. And uh, this one really works well with my youngest. He's four. And, you know, it catches my oldest, uh, almost 12 year old, off guard sometimes. Humor can just lighten things up. Remember to enjoy your children, have fun. Um, make sure, though, that you're sensitive about the timing because uh, sometimes humor isn't appropriate, especially if your kids are, um, are, are like if they've hit beyond reason and they're, they're really having a meltdown, then you're going to want to, um, you're gonna want to make sure that you're a sensitive to that because not everyone really wants to hear you uh, when you're really angry. So just, be sensitive to that, but humor can go a long way. And especially like if you crack a joke or give just a hug, you know, just do something funny. So I want to share a story about my youngest. There he is. <laughs> he has a really hard time getting dressed. And this has worked wonders on all my children. It's like some kind of reverse psychology or something but I purposely put their clothing on wrong and they get a kick out of it. They run around the house to show everybody how silly they look. And then they'll come back to me and they're like, no, mommy, my underpants go on my legs and, and my socks, they, they go on here on my feet and I get them to, to teach me how. And 
And then it's another point of connection. We're enjoying the time that we're spending together versus making it all about rushing and getting somewhere on time. And oh my gosh, could you please just get dressed? There's a time and place for that too. Sometimes we are struggling, but um, adding some humor and there's my messy bedroom in the background. So enjoy the sneak into my life. Um, special time is something that so many different parenting um, gurus will recommend. So Dr. Laura from AHA Parenting and Jane Nelson from Positive Discipline. I know so many others. Special time just gives you another chance for you and your child to have undivided attention. It's best if you can schedule it regularly with each child. You know how busy your own life is. So don't worry about what other families are doing. If you can catch each child once a week, fantastic. If you're able to do a few minutes every day, wonderful. Start with a short amount of time and build up whatever you can do. But this time lets your child know that you have their undivided attention. Ideally, you would let your child choose the activity and take the lead because it's their special time. This isn't a hidden agenda to try to get in an extra lecture or extra school work done. This is your chance to really focus on, on them. Turn off your phone if possible and let them know when their special time is over. Have a set time so that they are not trying to drag in or make you feel guilty for ending. Board games are fun, sensory play is fun, uh, reading, movies, whatever it is. You'll find that the more often you do special time, it fills their buckets and it fills them with the love that they need to be able to move on with the rest of their day without trying to get your attention. The other thing is the first few times it might seem a little awkward, keep going with that. And I also was gonna suggest that you um, Keep trying because you'll find that the more often you do it, they'll start opening up. Especially with your teens, if you find that they're an early, like preteens, and they start spending a lot more time in their rooms, get into their world. Ask them what they're interested in, take an interest, and they'll start opening up about other things. Uh, uh, something that came up in the chat it says, I don't know, Dr. Lorem suggests scheduling time. Sometimes it feels clunky and difficult relative to spontaneous special time, go with either and go with both. So if you have a set scheduled time that you can work with your child or that your child knows, then they anticipate it. They, are go they know, okay, my special time comes here and they'll wait longer uh, and not bug you as much or, or need your attention because they know their special time is coming. But if you have a few minutes to spend extra special time with your kids, or if your life is just crazy busy and that's all you can manage, then do what you can. Really, don't compare yourself with others. Don't try to go with, this book says I have to do this. You know what's best for your family, but anytime you can give your kids some undivided attention is, uh, is fantastic. When you are having a struggle with one of your children, you wanna work on winning over their cooperation. So think about it in your own life. If you know that you're having difficulty with a coworker or a neighbor perhaps, and they come over and they're like in your face, your guard goes up automatically and you tense up and you, you don't want to cooperate. You're just instantly like, nope, I'm, I'm gonna put up a wall here. Children feel encouraged when you understand and respect their point of view. You want to express an understanding for their thoughts and feelings. Might not be important to you, but it's important to them. Hey, I know that this was really hard waiting for your, your screen time, you know? I, I know you're so excited about playing Minecraft and, and you're waiting and I, I get that. Waiting is really hard. Show some empathy without condoning. Don't do an I told you so or, oh, you should learn how to wait. How is that going to help build them up and encourage them? That's just going to turn them off. You could try sharing a time when you felt the same way or behaved. 
make sure that you do this after the child has had a chance to express their feelings. So it comes off as more of, hey, I understand where you're coming from, rather than, oh, I know everything. That's always happened to me and this is how I handled it. And then focus on some solutions together. You'll find that if you really show some empathy first, they'll be more open to listening to you and then they'll be willing to work on a solution. Sometimes you might find that they need to have some simmer down time before that. Let me just go back to that one. For all of these, keep in mind that you might need to have uh, some cooling down time. When, when tempers are high, it's okay to have a cool down time. Now this is where the timeouts, positive timeouts, time ins, so many words go flying around the internet. What I wanna suggest is make a safe, calm space. I didn't have a slide for this one I, that just popped into my head to remind you all, but you want a safe place where that they can know that it's okay to have big feelings. And, and I can go here and it's okay to take a break when I have a big feeling. But when you put a child in time out, you're throwing them away with all their big feelings, locking them in there and say, think about what you've done. They just wanna think about how mean you were and what revenge they can get on you or, okay, my issues don't matter and I'm just gonna shut you out. They're not thinking about what they've done and learning from that. What you want to do is either be with them to help them work through those big feelings or create a safe zone in your house to work through big feelings because we all have them. I find them myself. How often have you locked yourself in the bathroom with chocolate or going to take a shower? Um, I've locked myself in the car. I'm out. I quit. And I just, I have to get out. So teach these things to your children. Um, it's okay to walk away and have some cool down time. And you need to work out what that word looks like for your family. And I have several blog posts that I've got about that. And I'll be doing some more as well. Um, but yeah, sometimes you need to calm down before you try any of these strategies. You calm down, your children calm down. Just trying to win over their co co cooperation when they're upset is not going to really work. So those are the big strategies that I have for you today. Want to make sure, yes. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to share with you, if you found this helpful, if you find you have more questions or you want to get to know me a bit better, I have a, a brand new course that actually starts on Friday. Our first session is coming up. I have a special offer for you if you register before Friday, so if you register Thursday by midnight for my course, I am offering you a free extra hour with me one-on-one. -on -one. So it, again, if you are listening to the replay or if you were here in person and you register by Thursday night, you can, I will automatically add an extra hour of one-on-one -on -one time with me. Let me tell you a bit about my course. It's called Peace for the Weary Mom. Dads are welcome too, of course. Uh, it's a course to transform your life. And what's different about it from most parenting courses is instead of telling you prescribed, I think you need to work through these things, they basically go through the chapters in the books that they've produced, which are fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have your own family. You have your own immediate needs. And so we're going to address those first. I have a wealth of knowledge I'm going to share with you during our sessions, but I'm going to find out and focus in on what you are facing right now to give you some immediate results in your life. We're going to, it's group sessions on Zoom calls, as well as follow-up emails with any resources I think you might help be helpful for you. And we have a private Facebook group as well that you can chat and message me during the week so that you aren't left waiting for our next session. The cost is $320 Canadian. This is open worldwide because it's online. So we'll just work out the currency conversion for that. All you would need is um, to have access to Zoom 
as well as email and, and whatever you need to open some Word documents and PDFs and things. So I have a special video on my YouTube channel that tell, goes into more detail there. And I just want to really encourage you, the transformation I found in my own family working with one-on-one -on -one with parenting coaches really makes a huge difference. We all need support, we need a village, and we need to be able to, um, we need to be able to help each other out. So there's a link there, joyfulmudpuddles.com is my website. Peace slash Peace for the Weary Mom is where you can find out more details about that. Oops, wrong way, just a second. So here's how you can connect with me. Um, most of you can find me on Facebook. You can click on my little picture and message me anytime. You can also find me on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Pinterest, YouTube, everywhere. It's, uh, you'll usually find me under Joyful Mud Puddles and joyfulmudpuddles.com. And the funny story about how I came up with that name has to do with the picture that's actually behind me on my desk. Uh, I have three boys. Boys are supposed, it brings me so much joy to see them jumping in puddles, jumping in mud, doing exactly what boys are supposed to be doing. But it also is an analogy for our lives. Lives are messy. And, but you can find joy in the mess if you just jump in and, and take charge, take hold of your life and try to find the joy in there. I wanna thank you all for joining me. Uh, this is gonna end this portion of the replay. So I'm going to be um, opening up for any questions that anyone has. If you have any questions that you want to put in the box, or if you have any questions with me, we'll make sure that we end. I'm going to end the recording.